Good morning. I am Christopher Coase, and I would like to say thank you for joining our Locust webinar this morning. If you're interested in learning about remarkable development opportunities in and around Greensboro, North Carolina, this is the webinar for you. Um, before we get started in introducing our panelists today, if you have questions, we are taking your questions in the chat box. So just type your question in the Q&A box located below uh, of your screen, and we will correla uh, correlate those questions and uh, take those questions at the end of this discussion. With that, I am very, uh, uh, very excited to introduce our panelists from Greensboro. Uh, today, our panelists include Sue Schwartz, who's currently the planning director of the city of Greensboro. She'll be joined by Steve Galanti, the current planning manager of the city of Greensboro, and Russ Clegg, senior planner of the city of uh, Greensboro. We welcome your comments and questions about these great opportunities in Greensboro, North Carolina. For those of you who are following along on the web today, again, you can type your questions in the chat box on your screen. You can also tweet them to at Locust Developers. Questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. Now with that, I'll turn this uh, conversation over to Sue Swartz. Sue? Thank you, Christopher. Good morning. Next slide, please. This is a view of our downtown skyline at night. We want to take just a few minutes to talk about why you should choose to invest in Greensboro. Next slide. Just a few highlights to give you orientation of what, about Greensboro. We are the third largest city in the state of North Carolina with a population of 287,000 people. We, have, uh, we are located centrally in the state. We have great access with uh, two interstates, two major interstates, and two more that will be designated interstates in the near future. We have seven colleges and universities that bring more than 55,000 college students to our community every year. And we invest in ourselves. In 2016, we had uh, bonds approved by our voters um, for over $125 million. Next slide, please. We have interesting places to live in quite a variety of places to, um, to reside. We preserve our history. We enjoy um, our neighborhoods. And we embrace the new. Next slide, please. We have several major employers like Cone Health Systems. We have Lincoln Financial with their headquarters here, Volvo and Mack Trucks, um, the Cone Health System, and Honda Jets. But we also embrace the other end of the spectrum too. We're one of the biggest spaces in the region with the Forge for Makerspace and many other maker and innovative, court, innovative districts. Next slide, please. Now, it's not all work here in Greensboro. We have a great place to play. First of all, we're home to the ACC. We also have two minor league teams, the Swarm for basketball and um, the Greensboro Grasshoppers for baseball. We have a building a four-mile greenway around our downtown, which is about two-thirds completed at this point, but it would be connecting to every other trail um, opportunities that we have around the city. And for the past three years, we've been home for the National Folk Festival with 185,000 people coming to downtown Greensboro. Next year, this will morph into the North Carolina Folk Festival, and we hope to be just as successful. Next slide, please. We have an eye on our history and an eye on our future. We were the home of Revolutionary War site, the Guilford Battleground. We also have um, we're home to um, Governor Moorhead, who brought rail to Greensboro, which spurred our first big expansion. And opening in the future, we will have the Tanger, sorry, the Tanger Center for the Performing Arts, opening in 2019. We're also home of the Civil Rights Movement, with the February 1st, 1960s sit-in movement at the Woolworths Building, that is now the International rights, Civil Rights Museum. Last but not least. We have a growing craft and microbrewery in our community with six major breweries uh, available, no pun intended, okay, intended on tap. <laughs> Next slide, please. As I said, 55,000 students call Greensboro home every year. The programs range from the performing arts to medicine, from en engineering and to aviation and to law. Next slide, please.
Thank you, uh, Sue. Now we'll go over to uh, Steve Galanti uh, for his presentation. Steve. Good morning. And just by way of introduction, uh, I co-manage the current planning division for the city of Greensboro. Current planning is responsible for staffing several of the plan review processes that are operated out of our development services office, particularly those related to site design, plan review, and we also have a compliance component. One of the reasons I've been asked to join this webinar is to explain what Greensboro has done to make developing property easier than ever in the city of Greensboro. Over the next several slides, I will explain those enhancements, and I believe you will agree. Our Development Service Center has been designed to provide developers and the citizens of Greensboro with a centralized place that can provide all the information you need while making improvements to or developing property in the city of Greensboro. Can you go on to the next slide, please? In addition to having staff available to take your calls or to assist you when you visit our office, we have several important pieces of information available via our website. The first item you'll see up on the screen is the Development Services landing page. This web page was designed and organized by several different categories. You can either go in as a contractor, design professional, or as a resident. It contains numerous links to important information organized by subject matter. This gives you quick access to the information that you will need to develop property in the city of Greensboro. The second useful website is our interactive zoning code. This allows easy access to the development regulations and contains hyperlink cross-references and an internal search engine to guide you to the information that you're looking for. The third item is our interactive zoning map. This web-based web -based system allows you to search by address and gives you access to the zoning category, any zoning conditions associated with the property, overlay districts, and several other site characteristics that you're going to need to develop property. The web addresses for these are provided on the presentation slide for your use. I invite you to surf these sites over the next several days to get a full understanding of the information available and how to navigate through them. Okay, moving on. Once you have all the pertinent information you need, the next advantage you will have in developing property in Greensboro is our ability to give you feedback on your design at different stages in the design sequence, and we have several options for that. You go on to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Our development service office is a one-stop shop that allows you easy, face-to-face -face access to those responsible for reviewing plans. All the plan reviewers and development contacts are available to answer questions and work with you to move your project from design to approval quickly. The reviewers are also available for pre-development meetings. These meetings are set up by appointment and allow the developer to come in and sit down with the site design staff to discuss your plans for the property and offer helpful suggestions on how to proceed in that direction. As you get further along in your design, Development Services offers sketch plan meetings. With this option, you set up an appointment after sending us a rough plan. And just like the pre-development meeting, it allows you to interact with the plan reviewers so that you may slow, smoothly proceed through review to approval. These meetings are available for scheduling on any weekday, but please be aware the level of input on your project will depend on the level of information you share with us during these two types of meetings. As an example, the more detailed the sketch plan you submit, the more detailed our comments will be. So you have the information you need and you've gotten feedback on your project. The next thing you may ask is, how do I proceed with a formal submittal and the timing for its approval? Next slide, please. Plans are submitted and reviewed in electronic format. The submittal and tracking systems are in, that are in place are web-based, and the plan submittal is uploaded as one file in a PDF format. The submittal system does require you to establish a login and password, but it only you have access to the plans and comments during the review process. The electronic version of the plan will be reviewed and comments will be made on that electronic plan and included in that electronic file. 
The submittal system is also your portal to download the plan review comments from the reviewers. There is a separate system that we have that you can use to track the progress of your plan. The plan tracking system will send you an email each time a reviewer has completed their review. The city's goal for reviewing the first submittal is 10 working days. We strive to turn around review of your revisions within five working days. The city also allows you to begin the other review processes. As an example, your building permit erosion control utility plans. You can do that concurrently with your site plan. But I do have to warn you, great care must be taken in moving in this fashion. A major revision that triggers changes to the site and vice versa could trigger changes to the plan in other processes and cause re-reviews and delays in moving forward. These are only a few of the benefits we offer to the development community. If you have additional questions or concerns related to specific issues, feel free to contact us accordingly. That concludes my portion of the presentation, and now I'll hand it over to Russ Clay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and good morning, everyone. This morning, we will be looking in detail at two different sites. The first is a site on a busy commercial corridor that is seeing a lot of new investment, both from the public and private sectors, and that is in a corridor for which the city has an adopted plan. This site could be developed for a variety of uses, including a mix of uses. The second is an opportunity to complete a significant portion of an infill residential neighborhood that is poised to really transform the area that it's in. So the first site we'll look at in depth is on Gate City Boulevard, across the street from our Coliseum Complex and our Convention and Visitors Bureau. I'd like to set the context for the site by looking down the length of Gate City Boulevard, which is seeing renewed growth and investment, driven largely by several activity centers located on the corridor. Starting from the southwestern side of this map, where the big Interstate 40 symbol is, just a mile over the, from the site, Gate City Boulevard intersects with inter Interstate 40. This is also the location our, of our Convention Center and Four Seasons Town Center, a regional mall. In the first few blocks near the highway, there are a large number of hotels and restaurants, and in fact, about half the hotel rooms in the city are located here. Back at the site, directly across Gate City Boulevard, is the Greensboro Coliseum Complex, which includes a 23,000-seat main arena, an amphitheater, and a very busy aquatic center. The Coliseum hosts over 1,100 events a year, including music such as the Eagles, Taylor Swift, and the Foo Fighters, sporting events such as the National Figure Skating Championships and portions of the NCAA basketball tournament, and a host of conventions. Continuing to the east, the University of North Carolina at Greensboro has expanded their campus across Gate City Boulevard with Spartan Village which includes a new health and wellness recreation center, six residence halls that will house 917 students, offices and classroom space, an outdoor performance space, and 26,000 square feet of retail, which will include restaurants, shops, and a small grocer. A few blocks further east and about two and a half miles from the site is the southern boundary of our downtown, which is seeing a lot of activity, including a nursing school, new maker space, and a variety of restaurants. Continuing east brings you close to North Carolina Agricultural and Technical University, another state college, and Bennett College, and eventually to another highway interchange, which is about five and a half miles from our site. Because of these highway connections and the regional attractions along the road, for many people, this is Greensboro's front door. The street carries an average of over 20,000 vehicles a day. In the area around our site, the city recently completed a major streetscape improvement project that extends from the Coliseum to the west side of I-40. The new wider sidewalks, pedestrian lighting, street trees, and improved crosswalks are all there to better connect the university, the area hotels, the convention center, and the Coliseum. Can we go to the next slide, please? To switch from looking at Gate City Boulevard and the traffic it carries, and to look more closely at the area around the site, Let's look in particular at the statistics of the five-minute drive time, which covers an area bordering downtown back to the interstate. These are from a recent market study the city commissioned for the site. The daytime population is 26,400, which is a 9% increase over the 2010 daytime population. Large employers in the area include UNCG, which has a student base of almost 20,000 students and 4,700 employees and the Coliseum, which has 580 employees. 
Currently, there are 3,052 households in the five-minute drive time earning over $50,000 a year, which represents 7,416 residents that can serve as a local customer base. I mentioned the large number of hotels nearby. Citywide, since 2011, we have seen an increase of 28% in room demand, but only an expansion of 9% of the supply. Occupancy levels, revenues per room, and the average daily rate have all increased. There is also an existing demand for a restaurant, including a quick service family style restaurant or a coffee shop. This site is very close to the Aquatic Center and the Coliseum, but it's also convenient to the highways and to downtown and other economic drivers. Next slide, please. The site takes up an entire block. The zoning for the site is called auto-oriented. This is one of three new zoning districts created for this corridor by city staff working very closely with the Citizen Oversight Committee designed to attract new development and create the character that the adopted plan for the area calls for. This district includes a wide range of uses, has reduced setbacks to open up the building envelope, and offers a range of options for landscaping to make a more flexible building site that still adds value to the area. The site is about 280 feet deep and 290 feet wide. We have demolished the building on the corner and performed a phase two environmental study. The site does slope to the rear at about 15 feet, which offers some opportunities for parking in the rear or the opportunity for residential in the back and a coffee shop or other use on the front side. There is room on the site for a hotel of about 100 rooms. Next slide. I'd like to switch gears now to a very different opportunity. This is Willow Oaks, a new neighborhood being built on a traditional neighborhood model. The neighborhood started as a Hope 6 project in the early 2000s and was going well until the 2008 recession hit. We recently adopted an updated plan to re-energize the process, recognizing new materials, streamlining the architectural standards and review process, and taking into account the experiences of residents that have been living in the neighborhood for the past decade. Willow Oaks is located just to the north of McConnell Road, which is a block north of Gate City Boulevard, about a half a mile to the east of downtown. In addition to being close to downtown, it is close to a large city park, North Carolina A&T University and Bennett College, and amenities including a new YMCA, one of the city's recreation centers, and Gateway Gardens, which is a signature outdoor space. It is a quiet neighborhood, but only blocks away from busier roads that give it excellent connectivity. Next slide, please. Here are pictures from Willow Oaks, and you can see the high quality of the buildings and the architecture. As a traditional neighborhood development, the houses have porches and short front yards, and the streets are narrow and lined with sidewalks. There is already a mix of housing types, 105 detached single-family homes, 110 townhome units, and 100 garden apartments. There is also a community center in the middle of the neighborhood that provides space for meetings and events. In working with current residents on the plan update, we found that the neighborhood residents have a strong affection for the neighborhood and will be able to help market new homes to people that are already in areas adjacent to Willow Oaks and are looking to buy a home. Next slide. The, there are opportunities to build new homes on scattered sites in the neighborhood, but our focus here is on the larger area of property that fronts McConnell Road. Area C is about 10 acres in size, and is the largest opportunity for new development in the area. Starting on the west side in area C1, the new plan calls for a two to three story building of senior housing. This could either be 24 or 36 units or over 70 units if they are for assisted living. Our market study indicates a large need for senior housing in this area and the long waiting list for existing senior housing in Willow Oaks backs that up. This area is located in front of Garden Apartments. Plans for the street in front of C1 include a traffic circle that will improve traffic flow, create a signature entrance into the neighborhood, and will open up land for new detached single-family houses across McConnell Road. Site C2 is planned for improved open space. This site is directly across the street from the community center and will feature a green space directly across from the community center. The building shown in the picture is planned to be, uh, have a roof but be open along the sides and will serve as a community gathering space that can feature food trucks, a farmer's market, and other pop-up retail. If the demand for incremental retail development is observed, 
Some or all the space can be filled in. C3 is slated for 26 attached single-family row houses of two or three stories at, a, at 1,200 square feet for the two-story model with two sparking spaces each. C4 is planned for 23 detached single-family homes of one or two stories and either 1,200 or 2,400 square feet in size. There's also room for two cars in each of these houses, and these are both planned for market rate, ha market rate housing. These sites are alley loaded and the infrastructure is already in place including alleys, sidewalks, lights, and water and sewer. There is a homeowners association for the existing houses in place that will manage the common areas. In the market area that we used in creating this plan, there are about 2,200 households that earn over $32,000 a year and could be potential home buyers in Willow Oaks. The Willow Oaks neighborhood is distinctly different than other housing available in the study area with higher quality houses and sales prices that are above the median price. Recent sales have been in the $100,000 range. This is a great opportunity to market new homes in Willow Oaks to, to college faculty, to people working downtown, and to people in the larger area that are currently renting but want to own a home. The current residents are familiar with the neighborhood and do not have, and do not have to be sold on living in the area. And now I'd like to turn this back to Sue Schwartz to talk about additional opportunities we have to offer. Next slide, please. Before we let you go, we invite you to consider a few additional sites. The newest one I'd like to point out is the North Church Street site, which is on the right-hand corner. Looking for, this site is looking for mixed-use residential, strategically located in our downtown, across from our children's museum, and across from our main library. We have more information available on all of these sites at the link below. Next slide, please. We've given you a brief overview of our community and the sites we have to offer. Our contact information can be found on the Locust website as well as a copy of this presentation. We're excited about all that Greensboro has to offer and we're looking forward to showing you these sites and more in person. This is a great place to invest and now is a great time to do it. So now I believe we have time. I'll turn it back to Christopher for questions. Thank you, Sue. Uh, the first question uh, goes to uh, Steve. Uh, as you outline in your process, um, you, you stated that it was quite streamlined. Could you give the average time that a developer can uh, expect uh, to go from uh, initial discussion to site approval? Uh, yes, I certainly can. Uh, what we've seen in the past couple months is um, moving through our system, um, as I outlined the plan review times for your first submission and your revisions, um, plans are usually coming through and going through about three versions. So you get three trips through our plan review system. Overall, from the uh, pre-development meeting sketch plan all the way through to approval, I'd give yourself about 30 days total to make it through our system. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next question uh, goes to uh, Sue. Can you provide a little more context about the current uh, public transportation uh, near those particular sites or future plans for investment? Um, we have, our system is called um, Greensboro Transit Authority, and we also have something called PART, which is a regional bus system. For the Greensboro Transit Authority, both of those sites are on major mm -hmm. um, bus uh, routes. Um, and several routes that connect. And oh, we also have for the um, UNCG sites and possibly for, for the Willow Oak site, um, for the site that's next to the Coliseum, we have something called HEAT, Higher Education Area Transit. These are free transportation options for students around Greensboro and they link major opportunities um, around just not just to the campuses, they go out to the malls and, and they come downtown. So you have basically three major options. Um, you have the HEAP opportunity for students, you have the, the Transit Authority, the Greensboro Transit Authority, which then can link you up with the Regional um, Transit Authority. One thing we didn't mention about Gate City Boulevard um, and that site is that particular corridor is also also being, we're working on plans to create it as a smart corridor um, and smart cities. We um, have two grant, planning grants working on that and we're working with UNCG to use that as our pilot project. 
so it would come up maybe a block uh, from that intersection where the, the corridor is. But one of the reasons we want to do that is possibly have smart buses that would use that corridor um, and use that as our test case. Uh, Sue, can you also talk a little bit about the mobility in the corridor uh, in terms of students or pedestrians using, uh, our, in terms of walk score or the use of bicycles in the region? Uh, can you just speak more about the pedestrian uh, environment that's there? I don't believe we have a walk score for the corridor. I haven't completed that. But we can tell you, well, this is a bicycle city. This is a, a pretty, we have a very active activist group called BIG, Bicycles in Greensboro. Um, we've also recently uh, become a, a line bike city, and you will see them everywhere. Their test case was um, UNCG, and they were so popular, they, instead of taking the six months to um, wait to roll out after about three months, they immediately rolled out to the rest of the city and they have become quite popular. Um, we have a very active pedestrian and bicycle plan for the, the, um, the city as a whole. That particular corridor, Gate City um, Boulevard, part of the overlay, or part of the, the planning for that calls for more pedestrian oriented. That's why the streetscape has kind of narrowed things down a little bit to make it easier to walk to different venues um, versus having to get in your car. And I can add, this is Russ, that um, even though we don't have pedestrian counts for the sidewalk at this point in time, I uh, have heard from some hotel owners, from the convention center, from the Coliseum, that they're seeing a lot more people use the sidewalks to walk. Uh, they, you know, are attending a uh, convention at the Coliseum but are staying in an area hotel. They're walking a lot more than they used to. Um, and our new zoning districts do include some standards that will ask folks to create a better environment when they redevelop the sites by moving them up close to the sidewalk. But do have some flexibility with where you can locate the parking lot. Thank you, Russ. Uh, to Steve, uh, can you speak a little bit more on the type of zoning overlay on the variety of sites that were highlighted? Right, in our interactive um, the website that we have for the, the zoning districts, um, we actually have on there um, several different, it's a GIS based system, so there's several different layers on there, you can turn them on and off. We have several overlays here in the city of Greensboro um, from uh, um, related to billboards all the way down to design uh, uh, regulations. Um, what this um, web-based system will do is if you find your property and there is a, either a zoning condi a conditional district for zoning or an overlay district, it will actually, you can do an identify and it will come up on the screen. And we also have a hyperlink to that design manual. So depending on what type of overlay district is, you'll be able to get to the regulations or the design guidelines for that particular overlay district. So it's all, uh, not only is everything there for you, it's interactive so you can move through the, uh, move through the city and to several different sites. And of the two sites we featured, um, neither one is an overlay. Um, the Russ can speak to the, the Gate City mm -hmm. um, site. The site for Willow Oaks is a traditional neighborhood district. Um, and has been modified to update for the, the newer standards that we have. Russ can answer or talk a little bit about the details of both of those districts. Mm -hmm. So the, when we were working on the new zoning district for Gate City Boulevard, the, the, the developers and the property owners in the corridor were really clear that they wanted to have good standards but clear, easy to follow standards. So instead of having an overlay, we went with new base zoning districts. So that allowed us to really open up the permitted use tables as well as really taking a detailed look at all the different um, uh, development standards like the setbacks and landscaping and things of that nature. So they're tailored exactly for the corridor, but they're base districts, so you don't have to worry about a uh, complicated process with an overlay. Um, for Willow Oaks, as Sue said, it is a traditional neighborhood zoning. Uh, with this new plan update, we consolidated some of the other standards, the architectural standards and, and the other pieces to make it a simpler process to go through. We've uh, changed our process from a town architect to a more uh, staff review, so hopefully we made that a little simpler process to go through. Thank you. Uh, Russ, as a follow-up, uh, can you talk about uh, which of the sites are actually publicly owned? Yes, the city owns the Gate City Boulevard site in Willow Oaks. There's a, a mix of redevelopment commission, 
owned property. Most of it's ha uh, owned by an entity called the Greensboro Housing Development Partnership, uh, and one of the sites is owned by the uh, Greensboro Housing Authority, which is separate from the city of Greensboro. And I should Thank add you. the Greensboro Housing Development or Greensboro Housing Development Partnership, or GHDP. That is a nonprofit that was formed by the city and the housing authority to facilitate new housing development. So they might not be owned by the city, but they are in the business. They're, they're engaged to do development for that site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Sue, this the question is for you. Can you uh, talk a little bit more about the employment and income growth trends in the city and the region and how they've driven new development? Um, we have, well, we, we have come out of the recession. Um, we were we made a couple of national headlines um, with our we were manu primary and man manufacturing based community. Um, our latest trends, our unemployment rate for the for 2017 right now is averaging a little less than five percent, a full percent less than a year ago. Um, the the workforce trends, and I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head. They um, we, we literally just looked at them last week. Um, the labor force is the largest it has been since 1990 and has been trending up. And so we, we have seen a lot more in the workforce. We've seen a lot more um, in terms of less, I should say, a lot less unemployment. Um, so we're really seeing some, some of the things in the economy um, where we saw start a few years ago starting to take hold and really start to prosper. Um, the major employers, HondaJet, is a, is a huge addition to our economic development um, toolkit. Uh, they are working, they have their uh, first personal jet product that was approved about two years ago by the FAA. They have two more um, under development. Um, and basically, according to several folks in the aviation industry, Honda is doing for um, aviation, what they did for the small car market back in the 70s, it's, um, there are two uh, prototypes that are online now have waiting lists ready to go when the FAA approves them. So they, they already have three to four years of orders um, that they are working on right now. So we're seeing a, a, a change in our economy and a change in, our, uh, in the birth of our economy and more people to work than ever. Thank you. Um, this question goes to Russ. Uh, can you uh, uh, talk about uh, whether or not the phase two, uh, or sorry, let me rephrase, has phase two environmental study been done on the Church uh, Street site yet? Yes, we just got a phase two um, report turned in uh, late last week, um, and the site is clear of any kind of major contaminants. There were some um, issues with contamination around there, um, and there are some very, very low levels of some volatile hydrocarbons there, but not anything that would stop any development at this point in time. So let me clarify, Christopher, did, did, was the question about the Church Street site or the, the um, Gate City oh, site? Oh, uh, it was the Church Street site, but if you have uh, additional oh. information on the Gateway, yes. Yeah, um, and Russ is right, that's the, the gateway site is what he was talking about, um, Gate City Boulevard site. The Church Street site did have a phase two. It has been cleared um, for both residential and commercial development. Um, the owner, and that one is not owned by the city, but the owner is removing, um, it was a former car dealership, and they are removing the hydraulic lifts that are on there, but it has been cleared, and we are good to go for mixed-use development. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, I'm going to rephrase. Uh, the question is, does, the, does your fire department support some of the new urban uh, policies that you guys are trying to push, particularly in our streets? But in addition to the fire department, can you really speak to how the city overall, in terms of the variety of agencies besides the planning department, is embracing this walk for urban development? Well, I think it's, it's um, embraced by everyone. The fire department has been helpful in testing out some of the um, standards that we have to see in, in existing locations we're looking for infill um, and the, the uh, transportation department public the our field operations which are the ones that handle solid waste they've been very supportive um, we are in a situation with in North Carolina 
um, where as a state we used to annex quite a bit as part of our growth. Well, since 2011, that tool has become extremely limited. So we are in the infill, quality infill development mode, and all departments have embraced the policies and helped us work through the details. And part of how that works out, and when you get down to a particular site, um, the sketch plan or pre-development process that Steve described is extremely helpful. It's kind of a giant brainstorming session, and it helps people work through those weird kinks, like is this, you know, if we do this turn radius, is that going to work? Are we going to have any problems with any other service delivery of the city? And we really, uh, people strive to make things happen, and so we encourage people um, to use that process. And just to follow up on one question was um, about the, the amount of time it takes to get through our system, we find that people who use the sketch plan review or the development pre-development meetings, that they tend to get through in a lot less number of reviews, and they tend to get through in two reviews, whereas the people who just submit the, the plan, they, they tend to take a little longer, um, another or three or four reviews. So. Um, I said yes. The answer to the question is yes, and there's a lot of ways we demonstrate how we embrace these new systems. Christopher, did we lose you? Um, at this time, if you have any additional questions, please type them into the chat box or tweet them at Locust Developers. Um, one of the questions, uh, Sue, uh, that was uh, uh, posed earlier um, that I forgot to bring up, but what is the current uh, tax structure or burdens that you're seeing from the state? Of course, there's a lot of issues that are uh, North Carolina as a state has been in news in, in the last six or seven months. Could you just speak in terms of the business climate um, that folks could particularly expect when and looking at projects in Greensboro overall? Um, our tax impact? structure... So our tax structure is um, pretty low. We're, I believe we're at 63 cents per, per hundred. 6.25, I think. 6.25, so pretty close. Um, the county is, I believe it's, um, uh, we'll look that, we're looking that up quickly. Um, comparable to other cities, uh, our services, um, as far as tax burdens on the state, I'm not familiar with the corporate, I mean, we've had a lot of tax reductions in the past couple of years with the uh, current composition of the General Assembly. So it's, um, it's quite favorable compared to other states. Um, we also should mention our uh, development fees. Um, people get shocked at how low um, they are, but we do it at a a little over a 50% um, cost recovery model for the development service fees that we do, um, and those will have, we have those posted online and can help walk through folks if they're looking at that aspect of the, co of the cost. So we can get more detailed tax information for folks as well. And the Guilford County is 75. Um, and the Guilford County tax is, point, is 75 per 100. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, I invite individuals, if you are interested in learning more about the Greensboro projects that have been presented today, um, please contact uh, Kira Hubert directly or any one of the uh, panelists that were on the call. Um, in the future, uh, in the next couple of uh, days, we'll send out a notification to all the participants uh, to gauge interest of an uh, in-person site visit as part of our Locust Link Up program. Um, but at this time, I just wanted to thank uh, Sue Schwartz. Steve Galanti and Russ Clev for participating on this uh, panel and really showing some of the great opportunities for creating walkable urban places in Greensboro, North Carolina. So with that, thank you again for participating and we look forward to seeing you guys in person in Greensboro. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.